Hello, and welcome to the latest presentation of the Rift Valley webinar series. My name is Martha Booker Johnson, and I am the host for today's talk. If you are participating in the live webinar, you can submit questions or comments in the chat module of the Zoom application at any time during the presentation, or ask a voice question by raising your hand once the presentation is complete. Today's speakers are Jennifer Miller and Yiming Wang. Jennifer Miller is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Archaeology at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. She earned her PhD in 2019 from the University of Alberta. Her graduate research examined ostrich eggshell beads as a window into Stone Age human relationships. In addition to her own project, Jennifer is also a collaborator on larger research teams working in Kenya, Malawi, and South Africa. As a postdoctoral project, Jennifer will lead investigations into Pangaya Saidi Cave in Kenya. The site is a massive cave complex with a long history of human activity that spans an important time in the evolution of our species. Yiming Wang is a postdoctoral researcher in the Department of Archaeology at the Max Planck Institute for the Science of Human History. She obtained her PhD in the Department of Geology and Geophysics at the University of Alaska Fairbanks. During her PhD work, she primarily focused on developing a new climate proxy of chitin preserved in lake sediments. After her PhD, Yi Ming worked as a postdoc at Keele University, where she studied past climate and environmental changes and land ocean climate interactions in Southeast Asia, or Southeast Africa, sorry, and Southern Asia. She has also worked extensively with provenance and sea surface temperature biomarkers to reconstruct paleo-oceanographic conditions. Please join me in welcoming Jennifer and Yi Ming as they give their talk, Ostrich Eggshell Beads Reveal 50,000 Year Old Social Network in Africa. Thank you so much. We're, we're very excited to be here. This presentation is based on a paper that we did recently. Um, first, let me give you a, a little bit more of an intro. You just got a great one into um, who we are and why this is sort of a unique collaboration. So our paper is a story about social interaction and climate change, but it's also um, about how we combine our approaches to find new ways to explore the past. Yiming and I have very different research focus. Um, we use different methods, we look at different kinds of data, but together we could use our various expertise um, to explore new questions and create one study that was sort of greater than the sum of its parts, more than either of us could do on our own. And this is the study uh, that was recently published in Nature that we're going to talk about today. So the, the new direction in human evolution research has shifted towards a more holistic perspective, one that incorporates biological, ecological, and cultural aspects. And this approach permits us to ask complex questions, uh, such as when, how, and why did regional populations connect in the late Pleistocene of Africa? and what, mechanis what mechanisms drove their eventual isolation, leading to the biological and cultural diversity that we see today. And it turns out this is a trendy topic right now. Just in the last few months alone, there have been several studies looking at social connections and the influence of environment on human behavior. In our study, Yiming and I used an unexpected line of evidence to examine connections between regional populations and looked at how these periods of contact coincide with climatic shifts. First, let's look at what's known and unknown about population connections in Pleistocene Africa. Morphological data from fossils tells us that our species evolved in a patchwork of semi-connected populations across the continent. Traits associated with Homo sapiens appear continent-wide at virtually the same time. And this tells us that small but structured populations evolved in a kind of biological mosaic across Africa. These groups experienced pulses of connection uh, with one another. There was enough connection that speciation didn't occur, uh, but they were isolated as well, and isolated enough to develop small amounts of regional variation. 
These connections and isolations were presumably in response to local environmental circumstance. In recent years, uh, genetic data, including DNA and ancient DNA, has become the gold standard really to explore these questions of relatedness in the past. In using this data, we can see a shared recent African origin for all people living today. We can also see genetic contact between Homo sapiens and our sister lineages, including Neanderthals and Denisovans. Within the African record, we see a deep division between present day hunter-gatherer populations in Eastern and Southern Africa. And in the recent paper by Lipson, Sawchuk and all, uh, it shows that these populations divided sometime after 80,000 years ago and likely after 50,000 years ago. And while fossil morphology and ancient DNA are powerful tools, to study ancestry and relatedness, they do have limits. They can provide an estimate for the timing of these disconnections, but preservation is a major issue, especially for ADNA, especially in African contexts. And the fossils and genetic evidence can never inform us about the cultural context of these exchanges. So questions remain about uh, the late Pleistocene, including where and when did ancient populations connect, what social exchanges took place, and what mechanisms provoked their eventual isolation. These questions are particularly relevant because around 50,000 years ago, populations in Africa underwent a major reorganization of their social systems. This time is also approximately known as the transition from the Middle to Later Stone Age, or Middle Paleolithic to Upper Paleolithic, depending on where you are. And at this time, we see numerous technological innovations, such as the regular use of blades and microlithic backed tools. But there's also important demographic advancements, like increasing population density, long distance trade networks, the regular use of art, and overt symbolic expression, such as the systematic production of beads. And all of these suggest that this is a time when the scale and the importance of social interactions were increasing, perhaps indicating people were coming into more regular contact with unfamiliar but culturally similar strangers. This might be a time when uh, social roles were becoming more formalized, perhaps even the beginnings of ascribed status or wealth accumulation, or social capital, where people could re re rely upon uh, these networks of allies to call on in times of resource stress. And all of these factors make this an interesting and important period to study changes in population behavior in Africa. Now, while we look at beads in our study, um, beads were actually around before this middle to later Stone Age transition, but in a different form. The oldest beads are found in the Middle Stone Age or Middle Paleolithic at the extreme northern and southern ends of the continent and in the Near East. And without exception, all of these beads retain the natural shape of the shell. Sometimes these perforations were even um, natural and the shells were collected on the beach and strung as ready-made beads with virtually no alterations. These are conceptually very different from the beads in the later Stone Age, which are what we looked at in our study. Ostrich eggshell beads first emerged about 50,000 years ago and they are the first fully manufactured beads. This means that they have an imposed shape where the original shell does not resemble the final product. And because their form is so highly shaped, there are lots of opportunities to accrue subtle variations. This figure shows the Chan Arpochoir for land snail shells into disc beads, but it's exactly the same steps as ostrich eggshell beads. 
And these are the first beads to be mass produced in standardized forms. Most are rounded discs less than a centimeter in diameter with a central perforation. And even though they are quite standardized, there are subtle variations. Variations that are functional affect the fitness of an artifact. Variations that are neutral only affect the form, and these are stylistic variations. These kind of variants are culturally transmitted, and they were probably not intentionally imposed styles, rather the result of cultural learning as information was shared between social groups. Long distances would reduce the opportunities for connections and sharing. And therefore, stylistic variations should have non-random patterns through time and space. And they do. Previous research found that ostrich eggshell bead sizes in Southern Africa shift with the spread of herding about 2000 years ago. The gray bar roughly represents the first appearance of domesticated animals in Southern Africa. And while pre-herding assemblages have small beads, post-herding assemblages have small and large beads. And this suggests that contact with new people and new economic life ways resulted in a change in bead styles. And this, this diameter change was recognized in the late 1980s, but the research into these diameter shifts has really only focused on a small region of Southern Africa and really only on the last few thousand years. But the earliest ostrich eggshell beads are more than 50,000 years old. What can the rest of their history tell us about people and these social connections over the last 50,000 years? When we targeted the oldest bead assemblages, the, the data sets naturally fell into two regions clustered in Eastern and Southern Africa. In publications in the last few years, it's become common to record and report diameters, but these are sometimes presented as average diameters by excavation level. And older publications may only note the presence or absence of beads or perhaps a count by level. And this meant that to conduct a comprehensive study of individual, individual bead values, um, it required traveling to the respective museums and assessing these beads in person. And this is what I did for my PhD. Overall, I analyzed almost 3,000 ostrich eggshell artifacts in person uh, from five different countries spanning 50,000 years ago to present. In our study, we used only completed beads with reliable age estimates. And so our study includes just over 1,500 beads, more than 1,200 of which are being presented in full for the first time. We used three metric characteristics, including bead diameter, aperture diameter, and shell thickness. The first two are the result of cultural behavior. While thickness is influenced by a number of factors, including environment and individual ostrich. But 50,000 years and 1,500 beads is a large data set. We needed to break this into smaller pieces for analysis. And this is where Yuming comes in. So um, we thought about how to break the 50,000 years into a smaller um, time period. And so in order to do that, and we look at climate shift uh, in Africa. So there have been major climate, uh, especially hydroclimate re reorganization uh, in Africa for the last 50,000 years, because that is a, a long time that covers interglacial to uh, glacial to interglacial transition. And, um, and if you see those uh, modeled rainfall maps now show the contrast between interglacial and glacial and see how the rainfall contrast in, in uh, northern and east Africa. And um, in turn, you can also see that those rainfall patterns also affected how vegetation would redistribute. So we can see those bio simulation from climate models also show that eastern Africa actually had a quite a different vegetation um, uh, distribution. So um, if looking closer, we look at modeled precipitation 
and uh, net primary production in over the last 57 years, we can see that Eastern Africa actually in general is much wetter compared to Southern Africa. And, um, and also it's more variable, you, you see the variation um, through time. And what do we see in the right side of this um, figure is that net primary production actually is largely um, uh, controlled by total pre precipitation. So um, in, the, in the higher upper corner, this is uh, Eastern Africa, uh, Eastern Africa pre precipitation, and that shows their net, pr net primary production. And on the left corner, that is Southern Africa uh, precipitation and the net primary production. And you can see that um, net primary production is really controlled by total precipitation. So um, here we can also further uh, see how the model tree and grass cover change over the 57 years. And uh, the large colored box, uh, the blue box and the orange box indicate the regions that we actually have all our uh, archeological beads. So um, the blue lines and orange lines, those are the um, uh, tree cover and grass cover of each region. And from this figure, from these figures, you can see the tree cover and the grass cover actually change a lot because of precipitation change. So based on um, the climate variabilities that, and we, we also look at uh, both primary, uh, both modeled data and proxy uh, data to show how the climate shift in Eastern and Southern Africa. Here we show that um, the here we will show this climate paleoclimate and transient uh, model data um, over 57 years. Uh, the large box on the map, um, as I said earlier, indicated the two regions that we have our uh, archaeological beads, and um, from the top, uh, this is our modeled data in East Africa. And the second curve that is uh, the paleo rainfall data from uh, Lake Tanganyika uh, used, uh, used, used a leaf wax um, uh, proxy. And you can see the model data and the, the proxy data actually show quite good uh, agreement. And then further down, we have three, three records. And the first one is Lake, Lake Malawi, is also uh, Lake Malawi's lake level. And the, the next two records is um, are the climate record from the, the, the Zambezi Mouse River uh, uh, in Mouse River. And one record on the top is showing the uh, rainfall changes over the 47 years of history in Zambezi. And the lower record is, um, the record showing the uh, the the source of the the clay, where the whether they are contributed from Zambezi River or contributed from the Northern Rivers, and the final the climate um, data is the climate model the data from uh, um, also for the southern south, southern Africa. So based on those climate data that we divided um, our entire 57 years uh, by five, five phases. And so four of those five phases are based on climate shifts, uh, except the last one. So those climate shifts, um, phase one is from 50 to 33,000 years. During this time, you can see the rainfall changes um, is fairly, uh, it's very stable uh, in Southern Africa, but it's very variable in uh, East Africa. And also uh, it's fairly wet conditions. And um, the second phase is from 33 to 19 Southern years ago. So this start from the onset of global ice start to grow. Um, uh, to the end of a uh, last uh, glacial maximum. And the third phase is from 19,000 to 11.6 thousand. This covers the whole entire deglacial to the onset of the Holocene. 
And during this time, the rainfall started to, uh, the, the precipitation started to rise again in East Africa, it's getting wetter. And um, the phase, the, the fourth phase is from 11.6 to two thousand years ago. And this marked the pretty much entire Holocene except the, the, the recent two thousand years. And phase five is based on um, from the beginning of the herding um, from East Africa enters Southern Africa. So, okay, now we have five different phases. Let's look at how uh, our beads uh, in terms of their morphology change through time. So during phase one, when East Africa is was wetter, and we can see the two regions beads are completely overlapping in terms of um, the diameter and also the aperture diameter. So the, the outside the diameter and the, the inner aperture diameter. And um, this, in fact, is the only time period that we have the entire overlapping of the beat morphology from the two regions. And coming to phase two, and this is the time that we only have one sample, um, beat sample from Southern Africa. Uh, so they almost disappeared in the archaeological record. And during this time, that what happens in terms of climate is that East Africa is getting uh, drier. And um, however, it, th during this time, the intertropical conversion zone actually shifts southwards. So the rim belt now is situated on top of Zambezi catchment area. So Zambezi River catchment area is the region connects Eastern and Southern Africa. And during this time, if we look at the record from the two Zambezi Mouse River um, uh, sediment core records, we can see that the rainfall actually increased um, in the Zambezi catchment area. In fact, this is the wettest time uh, during the last 47 years. And we also see more contribution of fine green um, uh, silt coming from Zambezi River. This is from Nerdemian um, uh, isotopes of those uh, fine green sediments. So this indicated that uh, Zambezi um, catchment is more, uh, it's wetter, and this would create periodical uh, flooding events. So Zambezi River um, is large, the fourth largest river in, in Africa. It's the largest river in, in Southern Africa. So this, er, this could also, the, the, the flooding events could create a um, geophysical barrier between the two regions. And uh, therefore, uh, the connection between the two regions could be lost. So coming to phase three, that is uh, the time that we see appear again, reappearance of southern beads. And however, if you look at the, the morphology um, of southern beads, that um, they're much, much smaller. So um, compared to the Eastern Africa, and the, they don't overlap very much. And during this time, the climate is getting warmer and the rainfall is increasing in East Africa and decreasing in, uh, in Zambezi catchment area and also slightly increase in Southern Africa. During phase four, um, this is the time that we already enter Holocene, the climate starts to stabilize and it's also very um, wet conditions. And also um, Southern beads became very abundant. Um, in fact, they are um, most of the abundant beads coming uh, in our record is from this time period. Um, and however, the two, the size continue to be very small and that is very different from the uh, Eastern B uh, style. So this could indicate the isolation between the two regions continues. Finally, um, we have re-established the connection between two regions. This only occurs at 2,000 years ago when the herding um, coming, herding a pastoralist, as pastoralists coming from East Africa uh, to, to Southern Africa. And during this time, you can see that the beads start to, uh, the bead size in Southern Africa start to have some, some bigger size that resembles this, the Eastern, side, Eastern um, African beads. 
So an unexpected outcome of our work is that it has an implication about the flexible social strategies in response to climate change. In Eastern Africa, the bead tradition is continuous and its characteristics remain steady regardless of any climatic shifts. And this consistency might hint at the presence of a resilient social network and um, a strong reliance on group membership and identity. This bead making tradition remains intact throughout 50,000 years, uh, even in spite of environmental uncertainty. In Eastern Africa, there is an overall higher net primary production and carrying capacity and populations there may have sustained larger sizes or more robust social networks as a strategy to help mitigate climate change. By contrast, in Southern Africa, ostrich egg shell bead characteristics vary widely through time and bead use even becomes rare uh, from 30 to 19,000, coinciding with the lowest net primary production and coolest glacial temperatures. And this loss of bead technology may reflect a strategy where populations lived in smaller, more dispersed groups with less need for symbolic behavior. And other archaeological evidence from this time seems to support uh, this, showing a staggered technological transition in MIS 2 to 3 with possible coexisting but culturally unique subpopulations in Southern Africa. These regional differences in bead use, in bead presence, in bead characteristics highlight the flexibility of human social behavior and demonstrate that there were variable strategies for coping with environmental challenges in the late Pleistocene. So returning to our big questions, um, when did regional populations connect? Well, our research uh, suggests that there were intermittent connections um, between Eastern and Southern African populations over the last 50,000 years. And crucially, it suggests that some form of cultural contact persisted after the genetic divergence estimate. This raises questions about whether these social connections existed independently from population admixture or coexisted alongside biological exchange that's not yet detectable. Further, we find it plausible that climatic variability and human behavioral responses to it could have affected interregional social networks by conditioning where and when people could meet on the landscape. And I think the, the um, most interesting and hopeful part of our study is that there can be new ways um, to look at these relationships in the past. So this is something that had not been explored previously, um, even though the, the data has been around and is available. Um, and I hope that inspires you know, research using new and interesting lines of evidence um, to look at these connections in the past. So perhaps linguistics, um, cultural anthropology, ethnographic studies, artifact variation. I think that there is a lot of room here for these kind of non-traditional studies um, and hopefully lots of exciting results that can come of it. So thank you so much for your time and we would be happy to answer uh, any questions. All right, thank you very much for your presentation. All right, and I see Bonnie has her hand up, so I will um, ask her to unmute. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much for coming here. I know we're a small group today, but a lot of people will watch the YouTube video. I mean, we're very, all very excited about what you research and, you know, just the idea of getting this great wind to prehistory, which is what we hope to do with linguistics, but <laughs> we're not quite at the same place, I think. So <laughs> I had one question, quick question about the beads. Um, uh, so I, I, I muted myself so I could put on some of my own ostrich egg shell beads for the talk. <laughs> so these were from a Botswana from a craft cooperative where they were um, manufactured and they're very different than my beads, which unfortunately have become unstrung from the Junkwasi in Northern Namibia, which are very smooth and very lovingly hand rubbing against the thigh of, of an elder. And I was wondering what differences in the smoothness of the outer diameter have you noticed? 
It's a great question. I wonder if we got beads from the same women's cooperative in Botswana. Uh, I have a string from there as well, and they are quite chalky, uh, a little bit rough around the edges, very small. Um, it, you know, this there's lots of room for future research into ostrich eggshell beads, and this is something that really hasn't been quantified, the degree of finishing. Um, between various archaeological assemblages, you know, ostrich eggshell beads have been known for, for ages, but um, formalizing the study into them is really just in its infancy. And so as of yet, there is no um, single scale for recording this. You know, nobody has really assessed this before. Um, it was suggested to me at a meeting a decade or so ago um, that you know, beads that were more finely finished might have been for personal use, while beads that were more roughly finished in a sort of quick expedient manner could have been for trading with other groups. Uh, I think there's a lot of fascinating work that can be done here. In the archaeological assemblages, I have seen all variety of beads. Some of them are quite roughly finished and have kind of been smoothed and worn down over time. Others are beautifully finished in perfect circles uh, with 90 degree edges. And it, it, there's something interesting happening there, but it just hasn't been looked at in detail yet. And uh, there's, there's lots of potential for future work here. I was also told that people could recognize individual's beads. That it be that is what Francesco Derrico says. Yeah, um, uh, apparently a bead maker can can look at this and tell if it was them who made it or if it was one of the women in their cooperative, if it was a neighbor. Yeah, there does seem to be something specific about it. And some of the studies that uh, Francesco Derrico has been an author on have even suggested that you can see this in the archaeological record where um, you can suggest a minimum number of bead makers based on the degree of finishing, kind of the overall shaping of them. Um, I, I think there, there's so much that can still be done with ostrich eggshell beads that, um, that there's so much that we could still learn from them. We're, we're really just scratching the surface. There's a question in the chat. Yeah, so I'll read out the question from the chat, which is from Andrew Harvey. Um, hi, Jennifer. I know that beads from Kondoa, Kisese uh, were used in the study. What was the process you went through to work with these beads? Were there specimens available in Canada slash the US or was a visit to Tanzania part of your research? Um, and in parentheses, I remember the Kolo Museum having lots of ostrich eggshell beads on display. Man, there are thousands of beads that really aren't even published that are just stored in museums. Uh, the Kasese beads in particular, I did not analyze. Uh, those measurements were shared with me by Christian Tryon, who did the measurements himself and uh, sent me his data sheet to use. For all of the other beads, at, at least over 1,200 of them, uh, the measurements were taken by me in person at the respective museums. There were a small amount of beads that were exported to me to measure in Canada during my PhD. These would be ones from Mumba Rock Shelter, some of the ones from my supervisor's project in Tanzania. Um, and I did not make any trips to Kenya, but I did study some of those beads here at the Max Planck Institute. Uh, all of the ones from Southern Africa were from me traveling there. And a very small amount were taken from published measurements. Uh, and I think 12 were measured from published photos. <laughs> so we were really just drawing every little last bit of data we could, trying to squeeze out, you know, as much information was available out there and um, gathering as much as I could during my PhD data collection. And this was a really laborious undertaking. I kind of understand why it hadn't been done previously because it did cost a lot of my own money to go and travel to these places. And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's managed to pay off in the end, uh, but it was equal money that there was absolutely going to be no pattern between the regions or through time. So it was really a, a pleasant surprise when 
all of this measuring. Um, and my mom came as my research assistant to my trip in Southern Africa, that all of her time as well kind of paid off into um, some, some interesting findings that maybe we'll still be kind of evolving our understanding of over the coming decades. Um, you mentioned something about trade, and I guess I was wondering about sort of whether we know anything about the social significance, how much these were used in trade, how much these were used um, sort of for, I don't know anything about this, but ceremonial or symbolic or other practices. Yeah, but there's a lot of great ethnographic data out there and uh, ostrich eggshell beads are really extensively used even today in Haro trading. Um, in the Kalahari. In fact, the, the word uh, haro sometimes doubles as the word for ostrich eggshell beads. Um, these were really prized possessions that sometimes had a value on their own and could be exchanged for other items, uh, or sometimes were just given as trade gifts that you know uh, established or maintained relationships between people who you maybe didn't see as frequently, but uh, just in the way that you might maybe bring a bottle of wine to somebody to sort of win their favor, uh, you might gift them with a set of beads. Yeah, I don't do the traditional pronunciations. Uh, it sounds like like Bonnie is able to. Um, yeah, there's, there's uh, a lot of great ethnographic data suggesting that these were used in all sorts of ways. Um, and they're on all sorts of garments, on bags, on clothing. Uh, sometimes making up their own jewelry in the strings that she's wearing, used as earrings, used in the hair. Um, there, there seemed to be a lot of variety in the way that they were used, possibly in the meanings that they had, and whether, whether they were just embellishments that were added onto things, or whether the individual beads and possibly the procedure of making them had meaning of its own. Maybe Bonnie will be kind enough to pronounce uh, the. Well, that's how it's spelled in the anthropological literature, but I was just trying to look it up in the dictionary <laughs> to get the, the uh, actual spelling. But it's probably a ch sound like in Dutch. Uh, I have a qu question for Yuming, I think more. I, I was interested in the comment about leaf wax proxy. I was just kind of amazed that leaf waxes could be, you know, kept over such long times. and and. This relates to my comment that most of the beadwork that the Hadza do alternates light and dark colors. And so that in the past, I don't know if that would have been done with porcupine quill or with vegetable matter. And to, to, if you're if you're finding a, a place where beadworking was happening, would you also find perhaps vegetable matter that might have gone in some of these beads? Um, I can also go show you one of the kind of and the Kelaguko in Hadza, is that a tuber or I don't remember what kind of plant that was exactly, but it, well, I'll, I'll, I'll go, I'll go find one, put my camera off and find an example. But yeah, the, the, the general question is beads were probably made of other materials. And so to what extent, if any, might there, I guess if you're working in museum collections, there wouldn't have been any remnants of that but if you're actually working in an archaeological site where you might find matter what what would be the likelihood of that well so so i um so i i actually don't know much about beads but in terms i could i could comment on the leaf wax um uh, part so leaf wax is just this shiny layer um on the surface of the leaf that is the normally uh this leaf wax is to protect the leaf from uv um, and insect at, uh, attack also, and, and also prevent water loss. And so, yes, they can be preserved in the sediments, lake sediments or marine sediments for millions of years. And um, then because the, the hydrogen isotope in the leaf wax actually records the, the, the hydrogen uh, uh, isotope of the rainwater, like uh, they, had a, they have a, a positive relationship of uh, not yet, yeah, right. So that's why we could use the hydrogen isotope of leaf wax to say something about rainfall changes. And in tropics that we actually, uh, uh, the, the hydrogen, the, the rainfall amount and the hydrogen isotopes are, are negatively uh, correlated. So the high, heavier the rainfall, the isotope values are smaller. So, so 
then if you look at the value change shifts between high and low, and then you can say, oh, it's a higher rainfall amount or lower rainfall amount. So this is how we could de derive a rainfall amount. But this, of course, most of, in most of cases is qualitative, it's not quantitative, unless you also use other proxies or other data to, to verify that your leaf wax data is indeed that show you, um, but it, overall they showed you the trend of up and down and then that's a higher rainfall, lower rainfall. But if you wanna really say something precise rainfall amount, then you needed to perhaps combine with other proxies and other uh, climate model. But in terms of beads um, made of other material, I just recently saw a paper talking about beads made of glass in, in defined in Silk Road in China. And I, I, I also have a collaborator in India. Um, he was saying that in their sites, they have found those glass beads um, also. So, so now I can see the connection between this India and this, uh, Central Asia and China through the Silk Road. And I think that's fascinating um, also. And um, so that's all I know about beads. And in fact, that um, Jennifer is <laughs> could probably better answer the beads um, made I'll, other materials. I'll, I'll just add that there's a lot of really cool kind of newish and emerging um, chemical analyses that can tell us a lot from very little uh, material. So, you know, talking about 100 grams of sediment, um, it, they can identify phytoliths that come from plants that were preserved from, you know, 40,000 years ago, telling us what the environment was like, possibly telling us what sort of uh, material was available for bead making. Um, with proteomics, you can identify tissue specific um, animal taxa from, you know, a, a little drop of blood or, um, you know, just a, a couple of scrapings of a muscle tissue. So there's, there is a lot that can be done to identify, um, you know, other kinds of plant materials. And um, in the, the Pleistocene of Africa, there's, I don't know of really any um, research that's been done on beads made from plant materials, but they must exist. Um, you know, people weren't dumb, so they would have been using whatever they could. And the preservation that we've got shows beads made out of stone, bone, you know, antler, teeth. Um, and I would imagine that plant material at a minimum was used for cordage um, to string these beads together. And there were probably, you know, seeds, nuts that were also strung uh, that just maybe haven't been really formally recognized or studied yet in, in the Pleistocene anyway. Andrew? This is a good point, Jennifer. I know that I know that the Hadzabe people, um, I mean, contemporary, they'll they'll use seeds for, for some of their beadwork as well. That's a common thing that they do. Um, this question is for both of you or either of you, uh, whatever you think fits better. I'm interested in sort of like concrete examples of of the story that you're telling here so we have this we have this sort of concept of a similarity between the beads in sort of the deep past i don't know if that's the precise term but let's say the earliest fact that you've that this paper looks we have sort of like more uniform patterns and then we have uh, and then we have a, a disruption in the uniformity that sort of corresponds with climate disruption or climate instability and then we have at the very end the last 2000 years we have climate stability and we have sort of reappearing similarities between the bead styles i'm interested and and correct me if any of that's like wrong or if i've left out anything um but I'm interested in like what sort of the, the picture of what that would look like. Like what, why did that, why did that non-uniformity occur? What did it look like? Was it people could not physically, you know, travel to see each other because of, because of increased rainfall or because of decreased rainfall? Was it the fact that societies were not able to, you know, sort of spread out and, and be in contact with each other because of, you know, subsistence patterns changed, et cetera. Like, I, I wonder if you have sort of any 
thoughts on what that could have looked like, what that sort of like connection versus disconnection sort of could have been. Yeah, so, you know, we, we really can only just speculate about how these bead styles might have gotten over this 3000 kilometer distance. Um, and one way that seemed kind of unlikely would be somebody carrying them all the way from Eastern to Southern Africa. Uh, it seems more plausible that they could be kind of passed along uh, as these ideas were diffused along a trade network where people traded with their neighbors who saw the new cool thing of these, you know, these beads that sort of look like little uh, Cheerios. They wouldn't have thought that back then. Um, now, the, the somewhat recent paper that came out earlier this year as well um, by Lipson and colleagues suggested that the genetic data does actually show a large amount of mixing between Central, Eastern, and Southern Africans uh, 50,000 years ago. So it suggests that they were physically traveling uh, long distances and intermingling with one another. And it's only after that that you really see the genetic divergence happen between each of the regions. So now the story is a little more open. It doesn't have to be that people were just trading with their neighbors down the road. They could be traveling these very long distances. Um, I think it's it's something fascinating that can be explored more in the future if we can think of, of a way to kind of tease out this information. Um, you know, was, was it the people that were moving and taking the ideas with them? Was it the physical beads that were moving? Um, which way around did it happen? Was it just the ideas that were transferring? Were people moving? Was it, you know, there, there's a lot of interesting work that can be done here. And uh, there was a, a paper a, a year or two ago by Brian Stewart and colleagues where they used a strontium isoscape map and they traced the source of the original eggshell, compared it to where it was found, and found that this individual bead traveled more than 200 kilometers. So in that case, there is some physical movement of the beads. Still not sure if that's people moving with it, if it's you know passing down the line in the trade network. Um, but these kinds of studies are what can push these sorts of questions forward. Um, that is not yet possible for most areas of Africa. We just don't have the background strontium data for that. But there are a lot of, you know, um, tricky, interesting little unique ways that we could draw out some of this information. And I certainly think it's fascinating to think about, you know, all of the different possible ways that the, the information could have spread, the, the people could have spread. And so while genetic data can tell us part of the story, um, you know, the, the cultural data also tells us another part. And by combining all these things, hopefully someday we can come to a better understanding of, uh, you know, just how these things were done in the past. But man, that's a long distance for, for people to travel or for items to travel, um, especially 50,000 years ago. Do you have anything you want to add? Uh, yeah, so actually, I don't know if I said it during my presentation. Um, it, the reason we're looking at how the climate change it, it affects the, the human social network is that because when we have a different rim patterns, that will definitely affect where uh, animal and plants will, will be, right? So people would move with where the food sources are. And um, so, in fact, a, a lot of the beads in the deep time in Southern Africa is from this place called Border Cave. And um, that is the closest site actually to East Africa, Eastern Africa. And um, so then, we, so that, that really like it got us to think perhaps that, it, as Jen said, it either is like a, you know, idea like uh, passed on by neighbors and to neighbors, or perhaps there is some physical um, transport of either the beads itself or with people movement. But uh, but we definitely think that the food sor source dis redistribution uh, due to the climate change could play um, some roles and um, where people could go and um, move and settle down. Just to show you, these are some of these Hadza beads. Um, I, I don't, I'm trying to look up the Latin of the uh, plant. 
that's used in there. Oh, wow. wow. Cool. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. You've got a lot of, uh, <laughs> a lot of I've been around. I've been around <laughs> a bit. <laughs> So Bonnie, you had added in the chat the pronunciation for this. Um... Uh, yeah, it's literally just the verb meaning to give. And, and and this isn't really a comment for you, but I mean, it really is giving. And, um, you know, as opposed to trade network, which sort of implies a, a more of a financial obligation. And I feel like this is what I've experienced is more of personal relationships. Yes, you know, that when um, when I've given someone something and Andrew, Andrew, I'm sure has experienced this too. You might give someone a scarf and then the next day you see a different person wearing it. And so it, you're connected through so many different people. And it's it's really, what, uh, I'm, I w it's more like giving and connecting than it is trade network makes it sound more economic. I don't know. Yeah, it's true. And both, both ways are documented in the ethnographic literature. Sometimes it was a string of beads that was traded for a spear and you know, the beads took this long to make. And, and um, certainly there's something about human nature that, you know, we have this desire to connect with people, to, you know, keep them in good favor, maybe to, to provide a gift so that they think better of us, or just to have something beautiful to wear ourselves. Um, you know, there's a lot of interesting facets to, to being a human and that we can see ourselves in the past where people did the same thing 50,000 years ago. Do we have any modern accounts of like how long a, like a like an ostrich egg eggshell bead would survive like with sort of regular usage? Do we have any ideas on like the lifespan? So here's some, let me, <laughs> so uh, I did an experiment where I bought some of the beads from Botswana, from the Women's Collective, and then I wore them for five years. And so I, every year I would take them off, I would take photos, I would measure how the diameters changed over time. And there was like a, a reduction in size of, um, you know, I think it was on the order of maybe like a millimeter a year. So this adds an interesting layer to, um, it, you know, could the smaller beads in Southern Africa have something to do with more of a tradition of, of being passed on uh, to the next generation rather than, um, you know, somebody being interred with these items that belong to them. Um, so it, in theory, depending on how big a bead you start with, you could easily wear it for, for years, for decades. Um, and a lot of the ones I've seen have incredible amounts of wear. So I think they're, you know, they, uh, they can last a really long time. And ostrich eggshell is, is incredibly durable itself. Um, yeah, it's very strong. And it um, is one of the best materials for radiocarbon dating because it retains its, uh, its, its structure incredibly well and it's like a, a closed system. So yeah, they, uh, they can be worn for a real long time. So Bonnie has put a question in the chat. Do we know of any differences in string types, whether from sinew or Sansa, Sansa Viaria Ethiopica? Sorry, I shouldn't have made you pronounce that. I felt like I was talking too much. I wanted to give people a chance. But I believe the Hadzes, and Andrew can correct me, use sinew. Um, yeah, I think really traditionally, traditionally they'll use sinew, but I mean, nowadays you just have the cat gut, right? Like the um, the plastic. Uh, the string from the gunia bags, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's tough to tell archaeologically. I think we're getting closer with some of the chemical analyses that we can look at. Uh, in all of the collections, all of the beads I looked at, I saw one that was not even that old that still had some string and a little knot in it. And it did look to be some sort of sinew. Um, and most of the ethnographic accounts don't spend a lot of time talking about the beads, about how they were made, about how they were strung. Um, and it might have a, a history of, you know, this sort of work being seen as women's work or not masculine or exciting. And so these kinds of things weren't documented. What, what sort of material did they string it on? What, what kind of patterns did they make with it? Um, you know, this is just not in a lot of these 1930s books 
And um, it's, it's one of those things, again, where there's plenty of room for research in that today. There's a lot of communities that still make um, these things in a traditional way. And this kind of stuff is the future of this research. And it can inform us about the past, about the present, um, in really exciting new ways. And you know, for anybody who's interested, the field is wide open. Anything you can think of probably has not been done yet with, <laughs> with beads, with ostrich eggshell beads. Uh, and there are very interesting applications to the, the past, the recent past, the distant past, and even the present. Just to throw this out there, these Kilagoko beads are meant for protection with the Hadza, especially with children. And this one's actually made with red beads, which is more unusual. Usually they like a pattern of alternating dark and light. And in some of the readings that we've been doing with the Rift Valley group led by Andrew and um, by uh, Matthew Nisley, we're seeing like red is meant to attract lightning in some cultures where black and white are maybe meant to bring rain. And so it would be amazing if at some point as a sort of a pipe dream, you know, that we some of these differences in bead assemblages might relate to climate differences. Uh, that's yet another thing that hasn't really been extensively recorded is the different colors uh, it, just among ostrich eggshell beads because heating does change the color of the shell. And sometimes you get beads that are black and you can't produce that from just a natural heating. That's an intentional um, oxygen reduced environment. And so I wonder hmm. if that sort of thing might have been more prevalent when it was more arid. You know, if if today the tradition is black and white might bring rain, then, you know, it, it would be really interesting to study that in the past. And I also wonder when when the climate was worse, did you need your connections more? So you saw more long distance trade or, you know, things like that. Yeah. And it, it seems like it it might be slightly different between the regions, you know, uh, you might rely more on your your neighbors, your partners, or you might go into smaller groups where, you know, it's it's less taxing um, to gather enough resources. You live with just your immediate family rather than, you know, uh, several households. Mm -hmm. There's a, a lot of a lot of ways that humans, you know, develop success. All right. Um, so I want to thank our speakers again. I think we'll draw our question and answer period to a close. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to remind everyone that recordings of all of the presentations in the Rift Valley webinar series can be found on the Rift Valley Network YouTube page and entries for each presentation are added to the Rift Valley bibliography. Looking ahead, the next webinar will be on Wednesday, the 29th of June, presented by Helen Eaton and titled Dramatically conditioned tone lowering in Sandawe. I would like to thank Jennifer and Yiming again for their presentation and everyone else for participating today, and I hope to see you again at our next webinar.